A good talk is like your name card for science. And today I hope to share in terms of technical layout, how I think a good talk should be prepared. Because why reinvent the wheel when you already seen how other people have succeeded presenting scientific information in a sophisticated, creative manner. Today, let's sit back, popcorns ready, and just appreciate some of these selected slides that I would comment on over the other screen to share why I think those slides are really effective and how you could also make your own using similar strategy. Welcome back to PhD Coffee Time. This is the online community for you as PhD student to get motivation, peer support, and practical tips during your PhD. Today, I will start with this Nobel Prize presentation of CRISPR-Cas9. Protein component called Cas9 that is uh, represented on this slide as scissors. It's presented by Emmanuel Charpentier, and I hope that will improve your own presentation as well. Borrow some of this way of presentation, and I hope you enjoy my sharing. Emmanuel Charpentier uh, was born in 1968 in chivisy sur orge in France. You may not want to introduce your speakers by the birth year, except in the very rare occasion that he or she is a Nobel Prize winner. She obtained her PhD uh, in 1995 from Institut Pasteur in Paris. And for part of her career, she worked at Umeå University in Sweden. This is a great example on what is necessary before someone gives a talk. You often talk about the education background, research expertise, and current affiliations. She is now director of the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens in Berlin, Germany. I would like to warmly thank the members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the members of the Nobel Committee, and all scientists who have uh, supported our nomination. This is not about the presentation per se, but you know why people start a talk by thanking everyone is sometimes because they suspect they may run out of time and they don't want to miss the chance of thanking the organizers by the end of the talk. Protein component called Cas9 that is uh, represented on this slide as scissors. Really great analogy. Two things I really like about it is the actual arrangement, how everything can line up like a scissors. And the other thing is the color coding. She is using color in a very cautious manner. Only the relevant section get any color. Everything else is in gray. It's easy to forget how you can represent data when you are only working on DNA strand of ATCG. But you can see she can highlight section of different RNA and complementary strand in green and in pink even the gene that is encoding the protein is also drawn in the same shade of blue. Really thoughtful way of using color. Continuing the use of color when the information is no longer relevant to what you are speaking about, you can cover it by a square, so-called 50% transparent shape. On PowerPoint, you just need to draw a box with a solid white color or a solid black color. And in the color field option, you can choose the transparency or opacity into 50%. Depending on your style of slide, you might prefer black or white or other colors. The benefit of that is you could also write notes to annotate the black word on the transparent white to stand out, then the white word on the transparent black background still stands out. Uh, the last uh, 50 years have witnessed the large development of, of a number of, of technologies, actually all originating from research done on bacteria and, and viruses. Emmanuel also presented the timeline of this technology that is enabling us to modify gene. And she highlights the important milestone in this slide. This is quite common approach when someone introduces a topic of research. You can present to the audience the overview by a timeline. I already have spoken in this video on Research Rapid how easy it is for you to create a timeline using your relevant milestone paper. I have always been interested in understanding 
how bacteria interact with their environments. Probably the easiest one and most forgotten one is to take a photo of your favorite organism that you are presenting. This is the perfect example. Even bacteria can look photogenic. You can find published articles that contain your favorite image. That shows your enthusiasm on the topic. So I think this colorized SEM photo is a great example. It speaks louder than word. Uh, with uh, the genomic component of, uh, of the phage that is injected into the bacterial cell. This slide is an example why learning Enscape is important. And I've already spoken about how to use Enscape in building figure and how to draw a beaker, for example. There's so much you can do after you created your own personalized shape. You just need to start with one and you can use it repeatedly, making a tiny adjustment on the PowerPoint and tell a whole story. The genomes of, of the virus that can replicate, and then you have the formation of viral particles uh, that can uh, lyse bacterial cells and propagate to lyse further bacterial cells. And in this case, another software come to my attention could be Photoshop. For illustration purposes, these are the SEM images of bacteria being lysed by viruses. They can be the hardest to comprehend until you put this image capturing reality and illustration side by side. So these are the example why you should be looking into spending 10% of your week learning a software one at a time. And I highly recommend image manipulation tool, not for manipulating your data, but to manipulate some visuals so that you'll be more on top of it when you're presenting a PowerPoint slice. So once you make one illustration, it's not going to go to waste. You can use it multiple times and you can tell the consistent story. Scientists uh, adopted this, uh, this uh, technology and showed in a very, very short uh, amount of time that the technology was efficient to act on, on the DNA and uh, modify genes and their expression in a variety of cells, including human cells, in organoids, in model organisms such as mice, fish, uh, fly, and also uh, plants. When she is concluding how this innovation may help different other research fields, she is using images, she is not listing them in bullet points, she is surrounding this by the model organism that it can be applied to, and the illustration, the field that they can be benefiting from CRISPR-Cas9. I think it's just really sophisticated, and you don't have to overuse word. And we do know in our days how uh, important it is to really maintain the research uh, in macrobiology, to maintain the expertise and to study more bacteria and viruses, not only because they can cause diseases and, and, uh, and we need to find new treatments. This is the nerdy moment when you are having a new gain awareness of something you didn't know about before. And for her case, it's the importance of studying bacteria. It's not only because bacteria make us sick, it's because there's a lot of unknown mechanism that can actually benefit healthcare and technology. It's not only because they can cause diseases and, and, uh, and we need to find new treatments, but also because the last 50 years have shown to which extent bacteria and viruses are, are really a valuable source for the development of novel uh, biotechnologies. When she described the future of CRISPR, again, she used a photogenic SEM image. It's a beautiful way to conclude the talk. Uh, this work would not have been possible without uh, young scientists uh, being extremely committed and extremely enthusiastic. And of course, everybody who wants to give a talk in a conference, you already know this is the drill. You always have to thank a bunch of funding agency, collaborators, and people who helped you, maybe their student helpers, your PI. I like that she has grouped the team into different boxes for different research interests. And if you have a bigger project that may have many people to thank, you can also try the same. It's a really easy way to do it. You can use university logo an institution logo instead of writing the full name so it's easier for people to just take a look see if they ring a bell. It has always been a pleasure to work with young scientists and this is also the, the reason why I like to do uh, science. 
The another approach I like to recommend in your acknowledgement is that you can have team photos. And a lot of time, people take fun photos in the lab when they work in the field. And use that opportunity to feature some personality. And if someone has seen those photos in the end of the conference, they may come to you and say, "Hey, that looks fun." And that's the conversation starter as well. So I hope this video inspire you to make your own. Design and adopt a personal style. Create an effective PowerPoint slides. Comment below. Did you learn something new today, or are you already presenting your slides similar in this type of style? And do you have a way that you want to suggest to us? You know what? If you have a slide style that you want to share, you can find me on Instagram, which is a really good visual sharing platform. And if you tag me, I will share this with my other audience, and we can all learn from each other. Thank you for watching, and I will see you the next time. If you're learning something today, please make sure to hit the like button so that it really will help me reach more PhD students out there. Comment below. Do you use already some of these tips? And share this with anyone that you're working with so that everyone can progress a little bit more as a scientist. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you the next time.